Coming up, one of the best songs of the 80s came to this band when they were hanging out in their flat. The second they wrote down the first sentence of the song without anything else, they knew they had a smash hit. I mean, the song came so effortlessly in less than 20 minutes from that point forward. They were exactly right, though. A couple of working class buddies were soon hanging out at the top of the charts with Madonna, ZZ Top, Whitney Houston, with their song, you know, becoming one of the all time cheating songs ever. But was this girl from the song a real person? We're going to find out next as the late singer in one of his last interviews ever tells us the definitive story of an 80s classic. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember counting down the top 40 hits with Casey Kasem of the American Top 40 Countdown every single week, you're going to dig this channel. Nostalgia all the time. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. Click the bell, all that good stuff. And uh, also check, check us out on Patreon. We have a lot of content there. So it's time for another edition of our show, Number One in Our Hearts. This is a show that honors songs that were so unbelievably great. They absolutely should have been at the top of the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, but at that time, they came up a bit short. Today, we're going to get the story of the 80s classic, Your Love, by the outfield from the late Tony Lewis. I just want to use your love tonight. Uh, Tony passed away on October 20th of 2020. And I, I'm just so fortunate to interview him uh, sometime before this about all the hits, including this classic. Now, the outfield was formed in London's East End by singer bassist Tony Lewis, guitarist, keyboardist John Spinks, and drummer Alan Jackman. They were all actually uh, in a power trio. It was called Sirius B a few years before this. But uh, they didn't find any luck as punk was all the rage at that point. So they broke up for a few years. But then they came back together under the name The Baseball Boys, which later turned into The Outfield. Even though they were a British band, they never did have success in their homeland, but they did in America in a big way. It started with their amazing debut album, Play Deep, that was with Columbia Records. Uh, that album hit number nine on the album charts, and it sold over three million copies on the strength of the singles, Your Love, of course, Say It Isn't So, and All the Love in the World. The band would have other hits uh, thereafter with Since You've Been Gone, Voices of Babylon, one of my favorites, and uh, For You. All great songs, though. The band took an extended hiatus in the 90s, but they came back together many times after that, releasing collections and playing one-off gigs. Guitarist, keyboardist, and main songwriter John Spinks he actually passed away from liver cancer in 2014. Tony Lewis actually released a solo album in 2018. It was called Out of the Darkness, and he toured uh, just before his passing. I gotta tell you, it was so great to see Tony live. I saw him a couple times in the summer of 2018. Never got to see the outfield at their peak, so that was really special. Up next, Tony tells the story of your love. And if Josie is a real person or a figment of our 80s imagination, this one's a can't miss, I'm telling you. For one of the most underrated vocalists of the rock era. Now, as we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eye, where the glasses I always jam here. If uh, you or your loved ones are in the market for a new pair of glasses or sunglasses, I got to tell you, Zenny is your best choice. You design your own frames and you just put in your prescription and voila, you have them delivered right to your door. Check it out today at zenny.com. Here's Tony Lewis with the story of your love. I don't want to lose your love tonight. It seems like every decade has an iconic cheating song. In the 50s, it was your cheating heart. Your cheating heart will. 60s, it was heard it through the grapevine. Oh. 70s, me and Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones. In the 90s, it was Creep. And then 2000s, Cry Me a River, Justin Timberlake. 
course, in the 80s, it was the outfield. And that was what your love was. This great rock song. Like you said, that was a song that you didn't even know if it would be a single. And it was the song of the summer in 1986. Play Deep comes out in 85, started just getting airplay like crazy. Went to number six here in America, number seven on the rock charts, it crossed over. Tell me about how that came about. Well, um, the song was originally, it only took 20 minutes to write. I was in John's flat, which you call apartment. I was in his flat and it was in the corridor and he had a little, tiny little cupboard where he had a porch studio and an amplifier. And I sat on the amplifier and he said, write this down. Josie's on a vacation far away. So, and I've still got the original lyric sheet. I've still got that blind uh, paper, uh, all the borrow marks on it and all the words. Come around, talk it over. Something, and I sang it, Josie's on a vacation. Yeah, that'll work. That's a good little pop song. We didn't know that it was going to be as big as it is now, you know, and it's, it was written so quickly. Was Josie a real person? Who was no, Josie? No, it's just not, it's not, a, it's not a true story. But yeah. I like putting a positive spin on a tragic story, you see. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> got a distinctive guitar riff to start out, and then it's got that unforgettable opening line, you know, Josie's on a vacation far away, come around and talk it over. Right from there, you know what the song is. Josie's on a vacation far away. And throughout the entire song, it's like you're in seduction mode. But what's cool about it is you don't know what happens in the end. Yeah. People still ask this up to this day, you know, who's Josie? Sometimes I make a joke, so it's Napoleon writing about Josephine and he was out to war. And they're like, oh, really? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about Napoleon and Josephine. Yeah. <laughs> it's just but a made-up story. It is. It's a made-up story, but what makes it so great is the way that you put the vocals together, the arrangement of the song, the guitars. That's why I think it, that power pop, that classic power pop song. Tell me what you remember about arranging it and recording it in the studio. Well, obviously it was done by, you know, we, we had a pre-production thing with our producer, Bill Whitman, and we recorded it as a demo, as a pop song, and he made it a bit tougher. But, you know, getting back to, like, we've grown up in the 60s, we we're very influenced by The Who, because every time you hear a song, even Roger Daltrey would say, a lot of bands would play, dun, 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 but we used to go, dun, 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 you know, attack it. We always attack. John loved cars as well. You might think I'm foolish. Maybe it's all and that's how it sort of all came about. I remember doing the, the bass line with the drums. Um, and it was, it was, it was, it was sort of, it was tinged with sadness as well, because that particular day we put the bass down, John had lost his, his mum and he had to go. But it was something magical that happened with that bass and the, and the kick drum that I just knew it was going to be a big song. I just had it in, just had, I had a feeling about it, it was going to be connecting. And with that vocal, you know, that uh, chose has gone on vacation, especially on radio, you know, I was, was always taught, you know, you got a hit radio running, you know, it's got to be the first line, it's got to grab people. Yeah, and, uh, and it definitely does. I love the guitar solo and then the vocals in the bridge where it says, try to stop my hands from shaking. And then I love your line on, and don't forget what I told you. That, oh, that's great. That's, the way you sing that is just perfect. Those classic background vocals, those harmonies, you guys did that as well as any rock band did. How did you put those together? Well, me and John, even in the demo days when we was at Scarf Studios, we never worked things out on the piano or a guitar. John would sing one part and I'd go in and sing another part. Our scales were so far apart, it worked because his voice and my voice just sounded like, when we do two voices, it sounded like four. And we never really analyzed it. It's just something we did. We, we, we just, it was just, just it just gelled. Yeah. That magic of, I mean, you all sound like your brothers. You yeah. Know, it's like your brothers. Yeah. What influenced you when you were singing? Like, because you've just got such a distinct voice. It's like the halfway point between Sting and Steve Perry, but completely original, like you've never heard it before. What were some of the vocalists that you grew up that you loved? Uh, it's definitely, I mean, the, the most impressionable band or uh, singer is, is uh, definitely Sting. And John Anderson from Yes. And that high, pure voice, you know, the guy from Survivor. You know, it's always appealed to me. And John he was a very big Steve Perry fan. And not, I was, and still am. I remember uh, in the 60s, there was this program called Rawhide. And it was, was it jo Johnny Ray? Rawhide! Mm -hmm. 
my dad said, oh, you can sing really high, can't you? I said, can I? I didn't, didn't realise. So that, just having that sort of, I don't know, having that scale, it was, it was interesting. And when I, my reading of a song like Your Love, like any other song, I own it. I have to own it. It's like an actor. You, you got to, if you've got a script, you've got to own that script. And I just wanted to own that song. Make it sound like it was, you know, I knew what I was doing, but I, said, oh, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> when you do the music video, it's not like this like grandiose music video. You're walking in and then this a live performance. What do you remember about the music video stands out? Because all of a sudden you're on MTV. I remember John saying to me, look, I'm not John Wayne and we're not actors. You know, I, thought, <laughs> I, I just thought that we could just make music. You know, I don't understand this MTV thing, but yeah. we went with it. You know, we recorded the, the song in Queens. And I think we started it about six o'clock in the night time at tea time. And we finished it about five, six, seven o'clock. We come out of the studio and the, and the sun was coming up, you know, take after take after take after take. And, and at the start of the video, I've got long hair and I'll get my hair cut. And then it switches to, Josie's on a bit. I've got short hair. <laughs> yeah. What was all that about? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And the video to this day still doesn't make sense to me, but it's about, the song. Yeah, it's true. You're walking in, you're showing people working together. You show the girl and, and everything like that, but it's really a, kind of a live performance take, but it was all over MTV. It's also been used so much in pop culture. Tammy, did you see how they used it? Yeah, yeah. Quite <laughs> funny. I don't want to lose your love tonight. Then, of course, Family Guy has used it. Joe is on a vacation far away. It was on Grand Theft Auto, the video game. And it continues to find new audience. But the most interesting thing is when you look at all the covers that have been done. I mean, if you go on YouTube and you look it up, it's probably one of the most covered songs out there just by indie musicians. You know, musicians you haven't even heard of that have pretty good versions. Have you seen some of those? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've I like Katy Perry's yeah. version. Did you that's see? Yeah. Very, very different. That's why probably why I like it because it's not trying to, you know, copy it note for note and line for line. I just wanna use your love tonight. And Bruno Mars. Yeah, I love Bruno Mars. What a great voice. I know. That's another voice I like as well because he's an effortless pop voice he's got, and he's you know he's a big talent. Chelsea's on a vacation for Bruno. My wife loves Bruno Mars. Yeah. Well, and you can tell there's some influence there because Locked Out of Heaven, very much a tip of the hat to you and Sting and kind of that feel of that power pop. Yeah. And he's got that tone. He does. That will pop tone, you know, that's yep. not easy to get. Your music video has hundreds of millions of views on YouTube. Did I know. you realize that? I know. I still don't realize. I mean, I realize <laughs> how it's my favorite Outfield song, but... It's hard to, to take it all in how huge it's become. It's almost as if it was a number one song. You know, it's, it's number six billboard. Being, being up there with Spruce Springsteen and ZZ Top and Madonna in the charts, you're like, us from East London? You're like, <laughs> no, we're kidding. up there with the big boys. It's, it was just, you couldn't fathom it out. John, of course, uh, passed on a, a few years ago from, from cancer and just a phenomenal songwriter. You. You and he had this power together to, to create incredible pop songs that we're still listening to now. What stands out to you about John, memories about him? We were very close. You know, I, I, I've lost my big brother, really. I mean, I shared a stage with him the best part of 40 odd years, um, especially with the, the outfield for 33 years. And, you know, he, he was always looking out for me. Every time I was in trouble and John was nearby, I, I felt safe. He was always looking after me and he just wrote some great songs, you know, and it's never going to be another John. No, you're never right. Never going to be another John Spinks. And uh, I, I vowed that I would never, ever go out and tour as the outfield. I'm totally from the outfield, but I'm not going to uh, put a band together called the outfield because when he passed away, that's when the outfield passed away because you, yeah. you would never get, I'd never get a better songwriter, guitar player and person. And he was funny as well really funny and we were really really close and i still still miss him well the new album out of the darkness and then the new single into the light which very soulful song 
You can hear a tribute to John in there. Yeah, I, th I, I, could hear I think the first three songs he was channeling me, I think. It, something was, you know, of his was, was com coming through me because I wanted it, the album to have the spirit of Outfield, but my spin on it. Me and my wife went to a local pub and, and she said to me, why don't you, you know, just, I've taken a four year hiatus and, you know, she said, why don't you, not, this, is, this is like after about two years of John's passing, she said, well, why don't you get back and just start recording? You know, it's what you do best. So I started do, doing some backing tracks and I lost my way a little bit lyrically. I was writing songs like, I'm going out tonight, I'm looking for a fight. And she said, do you think people would want to hear that in a song? I said, not really. And so she said, do you want to give you a hand? And she's very good at telling a story, but wife. So put some lyrics to the backing tracks and it just all, all seemed to fall into place, you know? Yeah. And some of the songs were written from scratch, from acoustic, recorded into an iPad. And it was the most easiest process of writing and recording I've ever known. Well, if you close your eyes, when I was listening to the song, when it came out, Into the Light, I mean, you sound like you sound in the 80s. I mean, you, your voice, hasn't lost a step at all. I'm, I, I was impressed. Thank you. Yeah. It's all done with mirrors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it was great. And it's a great song too. Like I said, very soulful. And I like how it switches up at the end because, you know, it follows the, the basic pop song. But then at the end, in the middle eight there, you change it up. I love that. Why can't you see all the changes you have made in And you can tell, I mean, I don't know whatever people believe in a higher power, whatever, or beyond. But I think John was there in spirit for sure. I, I think so. You know? Definitely think so. I mean, if, if, you know, if John hadn't passed away, I wouldn't still be making Battlefield albums. We wouldn't, would not, wouldn't have given up. You know, and he, he fought right to the last week of his life. He'd still want to record and wasn't giving up, you know. But uh, yeah, but into the light, out of the darkness, it's, it's got a couple of meanings, you know, out of the, the bereavement. But also, I've been known for all those years as the vocalist and bass player from the outfield, but I wanted to stand up and be counted. And look, I've got another strings to my bow. I produced the album myself, recorded all the instruments myself and the bass and the guitars and the drums and the yeah. keyboards. And just wanted to see if I could do it. And with my wife's help, Carol, with the words, you know, it's all seems, it all seems like a dream, you know. I, I really I know. don't know how I got here, but I'm here. It's 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 weird. It's a, it's a nice weird. It's a great return to, yeah. to music, man. Yeah. Looking back on your life, what are you most grateful for in this moment? Oh, for a load of things. For having a, a great family, great wife, supporting family, great fan base. Yeah. I mean, they've oh, been yeah. there since we first started out, 84, 85. And the, and the, the positive comments on social media, it's just, just amazing. I'm just very lucky. I'm a very lucky man to be out here in the US again touring. I have, this is my first tour for 14 years. That's a long layoff, you know. And here we are, like, was it show six of the Retro Futura tour? And I know. You know, I'm really. Well, I saw you were coming. I was so excited. I've never been able to see the outfield live. I mean, I grew up in Idaho in a small town, and I didn't ever get to see. I've never that, seen so. them live either. <laughs> so, so I'm excited, but I got to tell you that it's been, been an honor to sit down with you, Tony. Like you said that you didn't know what to expect, but I know because my friends feel the same way and we grew up listening to this music that this music means a lot. It's it's the soundtrack to our lives. So thank you so much for the music and thank you for your time. Today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So the top five songs ahead of your love, uh, the week that it peaked, uh, were the following. At number five, you had Live to Tell by Madonna. At number four was What Have You Done For Me Lately by Janet Jackson. What have you done for me lately? Why Can't This Be Loved by Van Halen was at number three. Oh, tell me why can't this be loved? West End Girls by Pet Shop Boys at number two. West End and The Greatest Love of All by Whitney Houston was at number one. Love all. And guess what? 
Even though the outfield finished below all of those songs and those artists back in 86, since then, your love has outstreamed and outpaced all of them. Your love has over a billion streams. I mean, guys, there's only like a little over 30 songs from the 80s with over a billion streams. It's amazing. And it couldn't happen to a, a nicer bunch of guys. We salute Alan Jackman, the late John Spinks, and the late Tony Lewis, the outfield. Hey, leave us a comment about the outfield and their catchy cheating song, Your Love. What do you remember about this song and this band? Let's talk about it. Share your, your memories below. One of the most underrated singers of the rock here, am I right? Uh, and if you like our channel, we invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Till next time, three chords and the dream.